camcorders, film cameras, and even cell phones that shoot video, <laughs> everyone can make movies. Filmmaking is the new garage band. This is Framelines, the show about people making movies right here in Ohio. Framelines is brought to you in part by Sabo Studios, gear for the show. Tape Central, providing your media needs. Production Partners Media, affordable media solutions. And by grants from the Greater Columbus Arts Council and the Ohio Arts Council. supervisor is also known as the continuity person and during the golden age of Hollywood they used the term script girl since it was considered a woman's job back then. The script supervisor makes all the notes while the recording is in progress and between takes. A script supervisor can keep track of all the cameras and write down what is seen by each camera. A script supervisor watches the monitor, usually with the director, and takes notes on everything in the shots as they appear and sound. Notes are written as to which takes the director likes, and possible continuity errors such as mismatched hand gestures, misplacement of props in a scene, or simple things like how much liquid is left in a glass, or any changes to lines in a scene. The script supervisor makes all the notes while the recording is in progress and between takes. A script supervisor can keep track of all the cameras and write down what is seen by each camera. Straight or squiggly lines on the dialogue of the script indicate whether or not the actors are visible or not seen in the shot. All information must match from the slate so everything from the shoot translates correctly for post-production and editing. And that is what a script supervisor does. Organization and production is incredibly important. Because filmmaking is a collaborative art, everybody has to communicate with each other. There are three phases to making any movie. Pre-production, which is the writing and preparation for the shoot, creating shot lists and storyboards. Production, which is the shoot. And post-production, where it all comes together in editing and everything involved in that. From the script, you can create the shot list. This is just writing down on paper what angles you want to get. You can do storyboards too. For each scene, you'll want to write out the shot name, then what type of shot you want to get. When you get to production, you can use that shot list and or your storyboards, and those will be used on the slate marker. After the shoot, when it comes to editing, the assistant editor will name the computer files the same as the what was on the slate. When you record sound separate from picture, it's important to say the slate information out loud. Four Baker, take three, marker. So that you can name the files consistently and synchronize everything more marker. easily. So if the editor or producer or director want to correlate anything from their script to match the shoot in editing, then everything can be found easily. I have an issue with TV. To be more exact, bad cliches in TV shows. There's a reason people don't call reality shows documentaries. What passes as reality today is so far removed from real that the term is so loose, you could call The Hobbit a documentary. This is what most reality shows would be. And now back to The Real Bachelor. Uh oh. Sometimes during playtime, boys and girls, things break. What do you do? Look to your left. Look to your right. All this manufactured drama and allegedly interesting lives are all created. Where did the boom of reality shows come from? General strike! Again, when the writers' union threatened to strike, TV networks decided to plug their schedule with the union-free reality shows that have no actors or writers, all to save a few bucks. Next time on The Real Bachelor. Good. 
Hi, I'm Peter John Ross. I'm the writer director of the Cell Phone Monologues. It's like this. When I was 39, I was working now and then on weekends for extra money, doing catering for Frank's company. I don't know, once every two or three months. Anyway, I met this girl, Sheila. She's like 20 years old. Yeah, it's every guy's fantasy. Date some really hot 20 year old girl, right? So, anyway, we go out for about three weeks. Wow, it was great on the surface. She made me feel young again. Like things were fun again. You know, like drinking a little too much or hanging out at bars or maybe going into work a little hungover. Yeah, and making out like two kids behind the bleachers. Well, anyway, then we go to this movie. Do you remember that Clint Eastwood movie, Mystic River? It had Sean Penn and Tim Robbins and, uh, 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 yeah, Kevin Bacon. Well, anyway, I'm sitting in the theater and this movie is amazing. And I look over and Sheila is so bored. I, and this is the kind of movie with no car crashes or explosions, but it's still just so gripping. And I'm looking at her and she feels me looking at her and she looks over to me and I say, do you not like this? And she says, no. Can we go? I am so bored. Anyway, it, we lasted for a couple more days, but at that moment, I, I knew it was over. I, it was the first time in my life I felt old. You know, it, it kind of creeps up on you. You don't realize it all at once, but I just can't be with someone who doesn't get it, you know? And I call this the Mystic River Effect. Yeah. Well, ever since then, every time I go out with a girl under 30, I, I reach this moment where I just know it's over because she's just too immature for me. <laughs> no, it's, it's not about the movie. It's not about the movie. It's about what the movie represents. It's about relating to someone. I, I mean, really connecting with someone. The idea for the cell phone monologues came from this idea I had that I wanted to take actor monologues, which are usually something shot poorly, where the actor is just, you know, talking to a camcorder with no background in particular, and combine that and actually with the opposite with really great cinematography. So I wanted to have an actor monologue, but have it look really good. Talking with my friend Mickey Fisher, the idea I had of the way to make that still work as a kind of narrative was to have them use a cell phone. So we're getting one side of a conversation. So the monologue is kind of justified by talking on the phone. I had worked with Brian Michael Block previously on another short, and uh, I'm a huge fan of the Aiden Five web series. This idea came from a story a friend of mine had told me, that, and I just converted it into a monologue from, for Brian to do. We shot inside Studio 35 movie theater and uh, just outside of the movie theater on Indianola Avenue in Columbus. It was nice to get that magic hour shoot and the look of that. Um, we used the AF100 camera. It was just a beautiful, shallow, depth of field camera. Very hard to keep focused, but it's worth it when you do the shots. So, all right, we, we've got the movie edited. We're done. We think we're done. But wait a minute, there's this whole process of, we got to sell this movie. We got to get it out in the world so we can get a recoup the your dollars or the investor's dollars. So what about distribution? What do, I mean, it's, it's a whole new world, but just how do you get the film in front of people, Phil, that are gonna get it out to the world? What's the, and, and maybe start with the basics. Explain the distribution process. Well, I mean, I think there are a number of paths. It's like first looking at the film and being able to look at what you have and think about who are the people I can really approach with this. Can I go to Paramount or can I go to Sony Classics or can I go to whomever? 
or have I made a film that's that's fits to a certain group of distributors? Like, well, you've made a lot of horror films, and I'm sure that there is like there's like a whole world of horror distributors versus indie film drama distributors, and so it's identifying those people. I think that you can take the film to who would be receptive to that. Um, you know, there's the whole self-distribution model and all that, and that's not something I think I ever want to touch. That's but painful. You've just got to, you've got to do your research and you've got to find the people that not only can you take the project to, but you've got to be able to almost like interview those people and find the people that you've, you, you have a good reputation, a good track record, um, that you can trust, and that's, that's through rare. it's very rare. And you, through referrals, people who are going to be above board about how much money the movie's making, where it's selling, how much it's selling for in those territories, or through those distribution models, it's a lot of research. Mm -hmm. And then you know when you when you think that maybe you've identified the best of the best, they probably have a long queue of people trying to get their product in front of them. Yeah. Um, I think in any more, like with our latest project, the idea was to, to make a film um, of, of a, a certain level of quality that we could conceivably take to anyone yeah. and try to, try to sell it to them and let them distribute it, let them uh, exhibit it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, Bo, you, you've had a number of movies get out in the world. So what was the process like for you? Well, it's, uh, you know, similar to what Phil was saying, that you find the right person. But, you know, this part of the process is probably the, the one that I, uh, I hate the most because it's dealing with the worst of the worst people in the world. Excuse me if anybody's a distributor in this room. Um, but these are the snakes and the, the bottom feeders, in my opinion, of the world. Um, they take what lots and lots of people work hard on, um, they take what lots and lots of people put money into, and then they, um, you rarely hear from them often as you would like. They'll call you daily until they get your movie, until you sign on the dotted line. And then after that, you'll be lucky to hear from them once every three months. Uh, and they're just, um, I, I just don't like distributors at all. I if really they're, don't. If their mouth is moving, they're They're lying. probably lying, yeah. And they're, they're the worst people that you can deal with in the industry. I have yet to meet one, and I've, I have done my due diligence on so many distributors and agents. I've contacted, I've had referrals, I've talked to people, and ultimately, if they can figure out a way to screw you, they will, and it's really, really tough. That's the problem with the business, is that it's really, really tough on that back end of it, yes. is because you just can't trust anybody. They don't care about your movie. They care about making, you know, what, Whatever cap they assign for themselves, whatever expenses they make for themselves, they, they want to reach a point and then are they really going to work hard to make your movie as successful as it? Probably not. You know, they're not going to work as hard as you work to make it. Right. Um, so that's the, the really, and there's not really much you can do about it. You know, you can try to market as much as you want, but, you know, Phil, you can't go to Japan and, and market on the streets and try to get it sold. And yep. Then you can't run to Australia and try to get it to the different buyers and, it's just a, it's, it's a really tough process. You put everything that you've worked for, all of the years that you've probably put into a project to raise the money, to find the right people, to produce it, to get it through post-production, to get it as good as you can, and you find somebody who says, oh, this is so great. This is going to be great. I know all these people that are going to buy it. And then you give it to them, and there's nothing else. You, it's like you're handing over your child, and then you're hoping that they're going to raise it right, and they seldomly do. What, so, I mean, what, are, what are a couple good... I mean, things you can do to at least lessen the pain in your contractual, like make sure you get audits every quarter, make sure that, you know, what are, you, what are the things you've done to, to be most well, successful in this? There's a lot of provisions that you can put in to, you can put in uh, performance clauses in there to make sure that they're doing certain things, that they're, you know, sort of giving you back certain amounts of money, and if they don't, you can get out of contracts early. But it, it really isn't a foolproof proof plan because... What happens is, when that time expires, so does your movie somewhat. You know, your, your, the shelf life of a movie is, is not great unless it's a great movie. You know, once you make a movie, you get a few years to get it out there, and then it runs its course, and you're not going to see a whole lot from it after that. 
And if you get it out there and it runs its course and you're with somebody and they haven't performed and you get the movie back, unless some other platform comes up, it's tough to make any more money because you can't go back out to DVD. You can't go back out to Netflix. You can't go back out to the blog. You're, you're there. You've done what you could there and now you're, you've run its, right. it's run its course. So um, I haven't done it yet, but the one thing that I like about sort of the crowdfunding idea is that you really essentially find your audience before you make the movie. Yeah. And let's say that you know you can get a thousand people who want to buy a DVD for twenty five bucks because they believe in your project, and you get twenty five thousand dollars to make the movie. Yeah. And you make the movie, and you found the audience. At that point, anything beyond that is gravy. Yeah. So, although I haven't tried it, and I've been through the traditional sense of, of raising money, that to me is the one sort of caveat of raising money through Kickstarter or something yeah. like that, is that you can find the audience right away. It's like pre-sales, back in the day when those existed, you know, and now who's going to buy a movie before it's made from a guy who they never heard of when there's, you know, thousands of movies that are being pitched to them every single month. Right. Those things just don't exist anymore. The, the distribution has changed over the last 15, 10, 15 years uh, in ways that I can't even describe. It's so much different now than it was back before. What is feature length? With so many people making short films and features, a lot of people want to know what is the exact length of time for a feature. Well, it depends on which official source you want to use. According to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, along with the American Film Institute, AFI, anything over 40 minutes qualifies for feature length. For television broadcasts, it means anything 90 minutes or over. In animated films, anything over 71 minutes qualifies as feature length. The first ever animated feature film was Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. The Directors Guild of America, the DGA, considers a motion picture with a running time over 60 minutes to be feature length. The Writers Guild of America, the WGA, says that feature length is any movie over 90 minutes. The Screen Actors Guild, SAG, sets the minimum at 80 minutes in runtime. The Sundance Film Festival considers anything longer than 50 minutes to be a feature film. So you can see, there's no definitive answer as to what is feature length or what the length of a short film is. Most festivals agree that a short film has to be under 45 minutes in runtime, although there's a black hole of movies with a runtime between 45 minutes and 75 minutes. And most festivals won't even program these because there's no easy way to define them between being a short or a feature. The art department is the section of a production's crew concerned with visual artistry. Working under the supervision of the production designer and or art director, the art department is responsible for arranging the overall look of the film, i.e. modern, high-tech, rustic, futuristic, etc., as desired by the director. Individual positions within this department include production designer, production buyer, special effects supervisor, draftsman, art director, assistant art director, set decorator, set dresser, property master, lead man, swing gang, and property assistant. Continuity in editing is essential. One of the most effective techniques for invisible editing is cutting on motion, like this. Here we have two separate shots, a wide shot and a close-up of the same motion. The key is finding frames of motion that match, then cutting at that point. Making a cut from the wide shot to the close-up while the movement is in the same place and we have a seamless edit. The viewer's eyes are naturally drawn to movement. Continuity of actors' posture, gestures, and movements are crucial to making this work. Whether it's a hand gesture, the way their head turns, anything in the frame that's moving tends to draw the viewer's eye to that part of the frame. Viewers are seeing the movement and aren't noticing the change in shot. 
And because we have two different shots, the wide shot is showing us more of the environment, and a close-up lets us know how the actor is feeling. It's much more effective storytelling. Okay, we're going to talk about gels. Gels are heat-resistant sheets of plastic, usually with color in them or sometimes just uh, diffusion in them. Uh, there are two types of gels. There are gels and diffusion. First, we're going to talk about gels. And it's the first classification I like to talk about are color correction. I have in my hand color temperature blue, CTB. And why would you use this? Let's say you're doing a, a shot where you have a big picture window and the main source in your scene is sunlight coming through the window. And all your lights, you need to add some fill and all your lights are tungsten lights. Well, you'll need to toss a blue gel on them to make them match the daylight. Otherwise, you'll have one side of the face will be all blue and the other side orangish. So this way you have a nice, even color temperature. Now let's move on to color temperature orange, CTO. And this is, again, gonna color your lights kind of warmish. Uh, why would you use this? Well, let's say you've got, again, another situation where you have some daylight streaming in, but the window is very small and the rest of your scene is lit by tungsten light. Well, you toss a gel like this on a window, it'll convert the daylight to tungsten and all your color balances match. Now you can use these color temperature gels for effects too. Let's say you've got a tungsten light, you put an orange gel on it, it'll really warm it up for a sunlight effect, like a sunrise or a sunset on somebody's face. You get your blue gel out and put it on your lights and maybe double it up to create a really blue effect and it makes them really cool and it looks like a moonlight effect. You underexpose a little bit and you have day for night. Next classification of gels I like to call party gels, and this is color for color's sake. You may want to put that on a scene where somebody's sick or some accent or a red gel like we have on the background here for an accent. But if it's like a horror film, you can really, you know, make the monster look scarier or create a, a, a sense of danger. Party gels are a lot of fun. Um, usually I don't use them in dramas because they overpower, but in a horror film, you can have a lot of fun with party gels. The next classification we have is diffusion. And what these are, again, are kind of gels, except they don't have any color in them. And you put these in front of your lights to soften the sources. I, in this hand, I have opal, which is a, a soft diffusion. Uh, it doesn't cut it as much. And this is 216, which really cuts the light down. In general, when you have lights, your tungsten lights, you don't want to point a naked light at people because in general, most of your time, your lights in real life are kind of soft source. You don't have really hard lights unless it's a flashlight or a headlight. So you'll toss a hunk of diffusion on the light to soften up. How do you attach a gel to a light? Well, basically just put the gel in front of the light, get a C47 media attachment clip, otherwise known as a closed pin, attach it to your light like this. And we're just putting a little diffusion on this light, which is probably what you're gonna do a lot of the time. Don't use plastic C47s, they'll melt. Another gel you're gonna use is called an ND or neutral density filter. And this basically just cuts the output of the light. Why would you need this gel? Let's say you're shooting in a very small room and you need to use lights, but they're too bright for your subject. You can't get them back any further. Toss in a neutral density filter, it'll cut the intensity of the light and you can still use it. Where do you get these gels? Well, you can go to a theatrical supply store in your town or find an online source like Film Tools and order the gels. They can come in sheets like this at about $6 a pop. Uh, you can get them in rolls, but that's hundreds of dollars. Unless you're like gelling a ton of windows, you're probably not gonna get a roll of gel. Uh, you can also buy little packets with different uh, variety of gel. Some's the color correction, which will have CTO and CTP. There's a variety pack, which I recommend for beginners, which has some color correction, some diffusion, and a, maybe a party gel or two. A handy thing to get from one of these theatrical supply stores is a uh, filter uh, swatch book. And you can look at all the gels in this and say, oh, let's go with this or let's go with that. So it gives you a lot of variety and really nail down your gel choices. I hope you found this tip helpful and I hope it helps you make better looking movies. We're here to point out bad cliches in movies. Ever notice that every single movie that shows you a plan about how they're going to do something and it never, ever, ever works out right? Whenever a movie shows the audience what the team is about to do, rob a bank, steal the plans, or do anything, it's like a roadmap of predictability to see how it's not going to work out. How boring would a movie be if everything worked out exactly like the plan? 
All right, you guys know the plan. Tommy, you at the jewelry store at 12.30, take out the security guards. Janice? I go in through the skylight, take the manager into the vault, get the key off him. Good. Now, I need you guys to cut the phone lines and turn off the alarms. I'll handle crowd control. All right, this is where you come in. You need to have your van right here at the entrance at exactly 12.41. You, I want you to gas up that car, make sure you got your glasses on, you got a map, all right? As long as everything absolutely goes to plan, nothing could go wrong. Everybody's good? The one was tailed, right? You got it. All right. Let's see what we got here. Nice. Mm. Sure. The movie would be a whole lot shorter, but it would be the most unpredictable movie ever if the plan went off exactly like they said. Coverage is shooting a scene from a variety of angles. Having more than one camera angle with varying distances, that allows editing. Each angle is called a shot, and each shot needs a new setup. Because when making a movie, lighting is changed for each shot to make it not only consistent, but get the best out of lighting and exposure. One thing that helps in editing when you get your coverage is to shoot cutaways. This is anything you shoot in the scene that doesn't need to directly synchronize sound like a close-up of an object or a person who isn't talking. 